Hello and welcome to Behind the Lines. I'm Diane Dayton. Today we're going to find out about CWS and that's Church World Services. With us right now we have the Congregational Resource Developer, Christine Bauer. Thank you for being with us. And Stephanie Gromick, you are the Community Resource Coordinator. Thank you for being here. Definitely. What is CWS? Church World Service is a, a local organization that works with the refugee and immigrant population of Lancaster and central Pennsylvania. Um, but Church World Service Global is also a, a global nonprofit that works with um, many different programs, um, hunger campaigns, education, health. Um, but here locally, we work with um, in arriving refugees um, and immigrants. How did it start? Church World Service mm -hmm. started post-World War II, um, 1946, with a lot of different uh, church denominations pooling together and seeing the, the displaced people in Europe and saying, we need to do something. Um, they saw the displaced individuals, um, hunger and um, poverty, uh, war-stricken areas, and said, we, we need to start collecting food. So it ac actually, the, the organization itself started uh, with loading up trains wow. in the Midwest to go um, to go out into the East Coast to be sent over to Europe with food. Um, okay. Yeah, it's really the foundations of CWS. Wow. And you are doing a lot of good work with refugees that are coming in specifically to the Lancaster area. And what is your job? What exactly do you do, Stephanie? I'm the Community Resource Coordinator. So in our office, I do, well, Christine and I sort of tag team a lot of things, but together we do all of our outreach. Um, raising awareness, uh, advocacy in you know the community to really speak up, and um, you know education is power. So that's really what we are focusing on right now is to really educate as many people as will listen on what the refugee process is, who are refugees, how they get here, and what they can do. Um, so that's a big piece of what we do. I also do all of our fundraising mm. and uh, development, so some grant writing and uh, different things like that. So. Okay. What about you, Christine? What do you do? Um, as the Congregational resource, resource Developer, I work with the faith community of the area. Um, more specifically, I'm working with teams of people, so our welcome team program, and um, we pull together groups from maybe a local church or a local faith community. Sometimes it's just several families working together and um, uh, I, I supervise these welcome teams who help to set up a house. Um, just yesterday we were at the airport picking a family up um, mm. with the welcome team and then the teams follow the family throughout the next several months. Okay, uh, yeah. so let's talk about the refugee status in Lancaster and overall too. It's very good in Lancaster. Um, so Church World Service, last year we resettled about 286 refugees this year it's a little over 300 mm -hmm. um, and you know things are very good here uh, for refugees the welcome that the Lancaster community has really shown is phenomenal um, we couldn't ask for more um, and so in a sense it has kind of given us a sense of um, almost like a disconnect from what is happening in the rest mm. of the country um, because not all resettlement sites are as fortunate as we are to have such a welcoming and embracing community um, people here in Lancaster want refugees here. They like having them here. They like the diversity, the culture, the food, um, all of that, you know. And um, and so we, we really do consider ourselves very blessed, very mm -hmm. lucky um, to be where we are. Where are the refugees coming from? Right now our primary populations are from Somalia um, and the DR Congo, so the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, a lot of them are, you know, we do well, let's say in the past five years or so, it's been a lot of the Bhutanese and the Bur Burmese refugees. Um, but those numbers are definitely, you know, slowing down and, and uh, you know, they're actually closing the camps uh, for the, in, in Bhutan. Um, and so the no those numbers are, are kind of quieting and uh, definitely we're seeing a lot more Somalis and, and Congolese. Yeah. How is that determined, where they come? Where they come once they're here? Yes. There's sort of, it's a really cool process actually. So in the United States, there's uh, nine resettlement agencies that do exactly what we do here in Lancaster. And so with that, every week, uh, you know, those, um, they have designated people within each of those resettlement agencies that meet in DC and they kind of get together and they do almost like a, like a round table discussion and they sort of go around round robin and they say, okay, uh, these are our cases. Uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement says, okay, these are our cases that are approved from overseas and they are ready for uh, resettlement. 
So Church World Service, we have this case. Uh, she's a you know single mother with three children, um, and she's ready to be resettled. Can one of your cities handle this case? Do they have the capacity to, to uh, resettle her? And so from that point, Church World Service would kind of look at what we have available, what our cities are able to handle, and then we would say yes or no. Um, and then we go to the next agency, the next agency, until all of those cases that are ready to be um, to be approved, uh, you know, are, are kind of divvied out between everybody. Okay, mm -hmm. it is quite a process, and we're talking about how welcoming Lancaster is for refugees. Tell me a little bit more about that, Christine. Yeah. So, so when we know that a case is coming to Lancaster, so mm -hmm. for example, a single single mother and her three children, then we're going to start pulling together. Um, you know, not only resources from our office, but see what the community um, would would like to contribute as well. And I have, um, with welcome teams, I have uh, a list of teams that have raised their hands. I've, I've gone and I've um, spoken with them and we've explored this sort of um, intentionally, holistically wrapping around um, a family. So at that point I say, okay, is there a welcome team that would be ready to, to welcome this mother and her children? And, and we start that process. Um, and you know, it, it might look like, um, you know, the mother might need some, some mentors um, when she, she arrives just to navigate um, resources for her and her children. Um, you know, maybe it will be um, having some mentors who, who take her to the grocery store and mm -hmm. explain different recipes um, mm -hmm. and, and the stove and the microwave and the, the school system being advocates for her and her teachers. Um, and it's really this holistic partnership between not only our office and those who in our office are, are you know, performing the casework and the official case management, but extending beyond that and saying that in order to welcome a family, we need to think about this sort of community friendship too. Mm -hmm. You know, who are our neighbors um, and, and how are we involving everyone in this process? Yeah. yeah. I know you have a lot of stories. Is there mm. a story that comes to the top of your mind that you could share with yes. us? Yes. Um, so, we have different uh, types of, of arrivals. Sometimes there's a family who's coming and they they don't know anybody in the United States and sometimes we have a family who's coming and they're reuniting mm. um, with family members and they've been separated for a long time. Um, and you know, it, it happens very frequently in our office that we are making a trip to the airport with a family member in the passenger seat who is reuniting. Oh, wow. um, and just this past December, um, this is a, a family that now has a welcome team. They've, they've been here for several months, but father had been here for two years and he had not seen his wife and seven children for six years. Oh, wow. um, and in, in December, just two weeks before Christmas, mm -hmm. we were going to the airport and um, it, it was uh, a reunification. He had not seen his, his six-year-old daughter since she was two weeks old. Mm. Um, and just being, being able to, to provide that space um, for the family to reunite like that, but then, then also be, be a participant in that very sort of sacred moment mm -hmm. in the family's lives um, is, is just something that you can't really, can't really, exp you don't have words. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that is amazing. Yeah. You have a website too. We're going to put that up on the screen. What are we going to find there? You'll find everything that we do. So you'll find background on each of our programs. So we have three sort of umbrella programs, and then each of those, um, for the majority, have different you know uh, portions underneath different programs uh, underneath each of them as well. But the main three umbrella programs is our resettlement program, which is um, really that you know first intensive case management uh, mm -hmm. for those first 90 days from the time of arrival to the 90 days. And then our second program is the employment program, uh, which really helps our refugees to build their resume, understand what they did back at home, um, and then how can that relate here. Uh, and then we help them to, you know, just really kind of move on from that entry level job and then up to that second level job. So we can offer them services for up to their first five years. Mm. And then the third umbrella is our immigration program, which is our only fee for service program, but it's also our, our only program that does not receive any, any funding from state or, or government, uh, or federal. Um, it's all fee for service, um, and so we rely very heavily on our monetary donations. Uh, the large majority of 
our monetary donations right now do go to cover expenses so that we can keep our application fees and costs as mm -hmm. low as possible for our families. These are refugees yeah. that are coming here with nothing and so you know we really we don't want to burden them with fees and costs mm -hmm. and all of that so um, so our immigration program works very hard to do all of that and they were able you know in our office were able to do these family reunifications mm -hmm. because of our immigration program oh that's excellent so there are ways on there that we can get involved and we can help too and reach Definitely. out to you through that and it is quite a process they go through to get here mm -hmm. and there are some myths that we want to dispel too so stay with us we'll have those answers when we return Welcome back to Behind the Lines. We're talking about CWS, and that's Church World Services, and we're talking about the refugees that are coming here to Lancaster. It is such a process. I mean, you really have to want this. Oh, yeah. Tell us about this. You want to talk? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> when, when refugees start the process um, towards resettling, they are, are entering into a you know, a, a system of at least 13 steps. And, mm. um, you know, it's, it's a rigorous background screening process that starts with them being given the legal definition of a refugee. And that's determined by the United Nations. What is that definition? That definition is um, a refugee is a person who has fled their home country because of a well-founded fear of persecution based on their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And they're not able or they're unwilling to return home because of fear of that mm. persecution. Um, so that that is a very um, legal and a specific definition that somebody has to be given. Um, you know, and there's, there's 20 million refugees who are made up of uh, a larger population of 60 million forcibly displaced people. Mm. 20 million of those are refugees who have been given that status. Okay. Um, and you're entering into a, a system to come to the United States of, of background checks that starts with the United Nation um, saying, yes, okay. you have been given this status. Then mm -hmm. what happens? Well, and then they sort of wait. Um, so the average stay in a refugee camp is about 17 years. Mm -hmm. um, Say that again. Yeah, the average stay in a refugee camp is 17 years. 17 years yeah. in a refugee camp. Yeah. Wow. It's a long time. And so during that time, they really are just waiting. Um, there's camp refugees, which is probably what you know the vast majority of people think of where refugees come from with the tents and you know UNHCR camps um, and that certainly is you know one group of refugees of where they come from but they're also coming from um, just really urban settings so we call them urban refugees and really they're just hiding in plain sight until their number so to speak is called and it's you know they're able to then start a 1000 day process for to be approved for resettlement. That's another number, a 1,000 yes. day process. Yes. What's involved in that process? There's 13 steps. For the average refugee, there's 13 steps um, to being approved for resettlement. So it's background screenings, it's proving your case, it's interview after interview, it's proving your case again, um, it's going through this whole, you know, uh, all, all of these things. And, and everything has an expiration date, too. Mm. So say that you are, let's go back to our family mm -hmm. of four, a single mother with her three children, and she has been, she's made it all the way through, say, step five. And so it's all of those initial security clearances and all of this, and now they get to maybe the medical screening. And now they each have to prove, you know, sh you know be healthy enough to travel and, and have their, all of their immunizations, but say that one of her children gets sick. Mm. Now she has to wait until that child is better for them to move on to the next step. But all of these other steps back here all have an expiration, a, a time, a time stamp on them. Mm. And so, so if her child doesn't get well fast enough for, say, step two, that now has expired, they have to go back and they have to do step two, oh, which wow. most likely at this time, step three, step four, step five, has now also expired. And so, basically, they're doing the whole process all over again. Mm. Wow. It's incredibly rigorous. It's very um, difficult. All the stars have to align, the moon, mm. I mean, everything has to be just perfect for a refugee to be resettled in that average of a thousand days. Um, and it's not, it's not easily done, certainly. Yeah. So once they're approved and they do make it through all of this, uh, their case is then um, 
they're then allocated and they're they're ready to be uh, you know to be resettled. So from that point, then um, you know they would look at um, based on which country they would go to, if they have family somewhere else, if they have uh, even friends you know that they would know of, or if there's a, a, a small population, a small group of of their ethnicity in another country, that's where they would go to. Okay. Um, so at that point, then once they are, uh, once their case is, you know, they say this is the country they're going to go to. That's when we get to the roundtable discussion that we talked about, um, where all of the agencies sit down and they say, okay, these are our cases that we have for this week. Who can they go to? And that's the process. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. you have a story, don't you? Yes, um, and the story really displays how there are no exceptions to this process. Um, we were expecting a Syrian family to arrive the very end of September of 2015. And um, we got to the week that, that we were expecting them to arrive and we got notice that, you know what, they're, they're no longer going to be arriving. Um, and, and the reason why is because mother had had a baby, a little baby girl, and she needs to go through, she needs to be added to the case. So mm. she needs to go through her background screening that now um, this is an infant this this was an infant um, there are no exceptions so mm -hmm. in our office we knew that the family's medical screening then expired in November well um, you know the the baby was not able to receive her her background screenings um, before November so the family had also gone past um, mm -hmm. several expiration dates mm -hmm. after September um, but we, we have been working hard. They have a local welcome team, and we do know that they are going to be arriving um, here in the month of, of, of April. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are myths and perceptions that we have, but the refugees that have come here, we hear such wonderful things about mm -hmm. them here in our community. Right. We mm -hmm. do. Tell me what you're oh, hearing. Yeah. What do we hear in the community? We hear that refugees are giving back. We see in our office refugees giving back. So of course we you know, rely very heavily on um, interpreters, right? So we resettle people from all over the world. Um, and fortunately in our office we do have uh, every language on staff, but that's a lot. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. 300 refugees every year. Our families are coming back and saying, "How can I? I want to help this. You know, like like you helped me, or like the the other refugees helped me. Now I want to help them." So they come in and they're actually volunteers mm -hmm. in our office. Mm -hmm. They serve as interpreters. They serve as you know, sort of mentors to some of our families. Um, it's incredible. Refugees give back. Um, that's what they want to do. They get here and they have even in best case scenario. Let's say they've gone through this a, a thousand days of you know waiting for their case to be processed and for them to start their lives over again. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we're seeing when they get here. Um, Christine can tell you, uh, you know, she was she welcomed our first Syrian family here, mm -hmm. and the very first thing that he said, even her case last night, when can I start working? Mm -hmm. When can my children go to school? Those are the first things that they want to mm -hmm. do. That's all that they they want that chance to be self-sufficient to be independent of, a, of, of every, you know, all of these services that are doing really great things to help get them here, but now they're ready, mm -hmm. you know, they're ready to be on their own and to really just contribute and, and start their lives all over. Yeah, they want to yeah. be a part of the community. Definitely. Is there another myth that sticks out to you that people have a preconceived idea of you other know, things? Yes, um, one that comes to mind is language, that, mm. that individuals coming here, you know, do not want to learn English. And, you know, we see that, um, you know, completely dispelled in from our office. Um, ESL classes are thriving in the area. Um, you know, individuals are, are on official wait lists for the really official classes, and then community groups and, and ESL classes have, have popped up at almost every shift that you can imagine, and individuals are walking to their English classes and um, it's hard. It is. It's. It's so hard to, uh, to you know, balance um, amidst the transition, mm -hmm. um, spending time with your family, your work schedule, and then fit English classes English. in on that. Yeah, <laughs> but it's something yeah. that you know. Uh, there's a, a want. There's this community uh, a wish here. So mm -hmm. you know, we we see that myth really dispelled. Yeah. Something, and, if I may, uh, some of our employers actually too. Um, realize that stress and that it is difficult for these families to 
mm -hmm. do all of, you know, adjust and work and take care of the children and all of these things. So they've actually uh, started ESL classes in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So they'll pay for those, you know, those, those workers to attend this ESL class. Um, they'll pay them their, their work wage and they can, you know, do their class and and continue you know so it's a it's a benefit for the employer as well as for the refugee too it's great to, to hear the support mm -hmm. and it's great to also see how the refugees are embracing mm. the community here and the opportunity and that the community is also embracing them and you're seeing that aren't you oh, Definitely. yes Definitely. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. it's yeah. really encouraging we live in a great great community i don't know if you knew that or not but <laughs> yeah, we do we really do we're going to put the website up on the screen once again to find out everything that's going mm -hmm. on at cws and how we can be a part of it because it does make a difference and we can help make a difference too Definitely. we're going to take a brief pause and we come back we're going to have some final thoughts stay with us We've been talking about Church World Services and the difference that we're making with the refugees settling in our community, the website, the Facebook page. We can find out how we can help with money, also with volunteering and donations too. A final thought, Stephanie. My final thought is, you know, um, we just want to get into the community and talk about refugees, you know, and, and um, to have people understand what the process is what refugees are going through, um, who they are, and to really just continue to welcome them as we have seen. Um, and truthfully, I wanna thank our, our community for the support that they have shown um, to our office, to our programs, uh, to our refugees. You know, the yeah. best thing, the easiest thing that you can do is just give a smile to a refugee as you yeah. see them walking down the street. Christine, briefly. Great, well, one, one thing that I tell every welcome team is that you know, it's the facts and the stories and what we hear on the news is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what what place do we have in this? Um, and and you know, locally here, we we do have an extreme amount of power. Um, we can welcome these families and empower them to move forward. And together, we can make a difference. Absolutely. And these refugees are adding to our community oh, too yeah. with their gifts and talents mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. Thank you so much Great. for everything that you're doing in our community and for being here today. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Mm -hmm. We'd like to say thank you for joining us today too. I'm Diane Dayton with Behind the Lines. And remember, keep looking behind the lines. You might be surprised what you find.